Hey, it's uh, good to see you. Uh, this, you know, this is Mark and Le- uh, DeVos. Is that, what's? Leanne, okay, well, yeah, right. And just retired, Mark, right? Mark just retired. I thought you said, sorry, I've been, I listened to Leonard Skinner too loud throughout high school. And, but anyway, um, Mark just retired from uh, high, last year from Highland Church, which is right down the street. And uh, our old friend, Jenny Morgan, is one of the pastors there. Uh, she used to be the drummer up at Lookout. So it's just so cool to have you here. If you are, what's that? Well, she is still, yeah, she's, she's amazing. But anyway, um, for you guys, anybody else that's new, if you're online and you're watching uh, for the first time, it's important to know that this is like our 26th or 7th or something uh, message from Romans, and kind of all the other messages have prepared us for this one today. I didn't just pick this out of the air, okay? So let's pray. Father, thank you so very much that you are our Father. And thank you so very much for your word, who is our Lord Jesus. And thank you for your spirit that inhabits your temple, your body, your bride, which is us. And Lord God, we pray now that you would help us to speak and to hear and to be what you want us to be, Lord God. In Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. Okay, Book of Romans, chapter 9. Verse 18, so then God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. That means God has free will. You'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known um, the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? even us whom he has called, not from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. About 17 years ago, I went skiing with my friend Philip Yancey. Billy Graham once said that Philip was his favorite contemporary Christian author. And at the time, I was Philip's pastor. For decades, I've been troubled really by two passages in Scripture, Isaiah chapter 66 and Romans 9, part of which we just read. I mean, this idea that God our Father would create beings just like me to be vessels of wrath or even allow them to become vessels of wrath upon whom he would pour out his unending wrath, well, that was just a bit problematic for my heart. Philip had recently written this uh, really wonderful book titled, What's So Amazing About Grace? And so I wanted to try out some of my theories on Philip. Near the Morrison exit, I said, hey, Philip, do you think it's possible that vessels of wrath don't have a soul? And so aren't really persons like you or like me, and so God just annihilates them because they don't actually exist. So, so everything that's anything, he does make new, just like he says in Revelation 21. And I remember Philip stopped me. He looked me in the eye and he said, Peter, are, are you trying to get me in trouble? And he wasn't joking. So I said, no, and, and, I, and I changed the topic. From hundreds, I mean maybe thousands of angry emails and letters, he had learned that grace can be amazing, but not too amazing. At the time, I was simply hoping that God saved everyone that's anyone, and, and I was trying to deal with all the passages that clearly said he did. For whatever reason, I used to know a lot of famous evangelical leaders, and I discovered that almost all of them hoped what I hoped and thought it was basically biblical, but then went to great pains to ever avoid saying such things in public. 
It seems that we need people to blame, people on whom we can vent our anger and our wrath, and vessels of wrath, that fits the bill. And just the thought, just the thought of vessels of wrath is, is helpful for us pastors getting our way. So even if we pastors don't talk about it, I think we kind of want everyone to assume it. If you don't sign up for camp or give to the building program, well, yeah, you could be vessel of wrath. Ever since Tertullian, the first Roman theologian, many like Augustine and Aquinas, Jonathan Edwards, even Isaac Watts have taught that the suffering of the vessels of wrath will actually increase the eternal joy of the vessels of mercy. If you're of the Calvinist bent, it will supposedly make you grateful for God's kindness to you. And if you're of the Arminian bent, it will supposedly amplify the dignity of your free choice, for there's, you know, so much dignity and endlessly gloating over other people's sufferings. I guess. I once tried to have the conversation with my dad, you know, who was a pastor. And he was so horrified at just the mention of the term vessels of wrath, or even the thought of people without souls, that, that he just didn't want to talk about it, vessels of wrath. I think it's like a dirty family secret that kind of haunts everything we do as Christians. Some find it enticing as an outlet for their unforgiveness and anger. Some find it useful in issuing threats and getting their way. Although it does make people obedient with their words and sometimes with their actions, it sure does make us kind of like doubt the love of God our Father in our hearts, doesn't it? I think it makes us all kind of secretly angry. So what is a vessel of wrath? What's a vessel for that matter? You know, Adam is a vessel. He's an earthen vessel. On the sixth day of creation, God took a lump of clay and made Adam. And then, out of the same lump, Farama, he made Eve. Paul's going to use this word again in two chapters when he writes, if the dough offered as the first fruits is holy, so is the whole Farama. That would be a good title for a church. The whole Farama, the whole lump. And you see, that's interesting because we're all made from the same lump. And according to Paul, Jesus is the eschatos Adam, which makes all of us the eschatos Eve, his, his bride, who is actually his body, all the same, all the same lump. Well, vessels contain stuff, or, or they don't, which kind of, I don't know, pisses you off, right? I mean, you go to get the wine bottle from off the shelf, and there's nothing in it. Makes you angry, makes you angry. A vessel's real worth is not defined by what it is, but by the empty space within it, which is to contain what it is not. A vessel can be sealed, vessel can be opened, a vessel can be opened at both ends so that what it contains is always moving like blood in a blood vessel. Eighteen years ago, one of the vessels in my heart got like, well, full of itself and stopped bleeding. I almost died. My whole body was angry at that one blood vessel. But then profoundly grateful for that one blood vessel once the doctor reamed it out and it started bleeding once again. Well, we're all vessels. So what's a vessel of wrath? Orge in, in Greek. Orge is in one word group with words like organ and orgasm. Now it obviously means anger in, in places, but it's more than simply anger. It's like the expression of a deep, deep passion. And God has orge. God has wrath, or at least he, he had wrath. The, wrath. the wrath of God is like just some pretty wild, crazy stuff. So far in Romans, this is what we've learned. And remember, Romans 1.18, 
The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. Remember, Jesus is the truth. The truth imprisoned in the chains of their own unrighteousness. It pisses God off when you do that. Romans 2, 5. With our hard and impenitent heart, writes Paul, we're storing up wrath for the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Romans 2, 8. So for those who are self-seeking about themselves, you know, and don't obey the truth, imprisoned within them, I would suppose, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. But in 3, 5, we learn that our unrighteousness actually reveals the righteous judgment of God, which Paul reveals to be like the most important thing that ever happens in the realm of space and time. In 4.15, we learn that the law, which is the knowledge of good and evil taken from a tree in order to justify ourselves, the law brings wrath. And yet God planted that tree, didn't he? In 5.9, we learn that when Jesus gave his life on the tree, it was like heart surgery, a blood transfusion, which saves us from the wrath, just the wrath. Translators often add the phrase of God, but of God's not in the text. See, it's not only God that gets angry. I mean, you get angry, don't you? And sometimes at God? Here in Romans 9, Paul mentions these vessels of wrath. But in 12, 19, Paul is gonna tell us to never avenge ourselves, but to give place, to make space for the wrath of God. Then he tells us to be kind to our enemies for it's literally, it's heaping burning coals on their heads. It's overcoming evil with good. You see, wrath is just like a crazy thing in the book of Romans. It's a crazy thing in the whole Bible. Places like Genesis 15, Deuteronomy 31 make it clear that God plans for our sin, delivers us over to our, our, our sins. He hardens our hearts, even Paul says. And then he even plans his wrath in response to that sin. Just now in our text, Paul wrote, what if God desiring to show his wrath? See, God plans his wrath as if there is an eternal purpose for his, his, his wrath, an eternal purpose imposed on temporality. And, and, and yet, both the Old Testament and the New Testament are very clear that the wrath of God comes to an end. That's why endless wrath is profoundly unbiblical, as well as just stupid. It would mean that God would be endlessly dissatisfied with his own failure to make people in his image and fill all creation with love. God would be endlessly unsaved from his own anger. Because when you're angry, you want something to change, right? In the Revelation, wrath comes to an end. And it's revealed that Jesus is the end. Which I guess is why he lifted his head on the tree and cried, it is finished. And check this out, in the Revelation, there are bowls of wrath. <laughs> Bowl. That's like vessels of wrath. And in the bowls, if you pay attention, is blood. Blood which burns like fire, but is also wine. <laughs> Imagine that, the very best of wine. It flows like a river from a slaughtered lamb standing on a throne, a throne which is a wine press, a wine press that crushes grapes of wrath, which are vessels of wrath, transforming the blood of those grapes into the wine of God's mercy. So, wrath is like the fluid that love bleeds enthroned on a tree in a garden. And check this out, all you vessels, you earthen vessels, every weekend you come here to drink blood that is wine. In other words, wrath that is mercy. So anyway, Paul writes, what if? He's not even saying that this is the case. But what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Which raises another fascinating question. Who prepares these vessels for destruction? Paul tells us that God himself prepares the vessels of mercy beforehand 
a word that's only used one other place in the New Testament by Paul. He prepares the, the, these, these vessels of mercy beforehand, at least before the vessels of wrath are prepared for destruction. God prepares vessels of wrath beforehand as if those vessels are eternal, but vessels of wrath, vessels of mercy beforehand, as if they're eternal, vessels of wrath are prepared for destruction in time. You know, according to Scripture, all that God does endures forever. Ecclesiastes 3, wisest man ever lived, Solomon writes this, whatever God does endures forever. So are you something God does? Then listen closely. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. That which is has already been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. <laughs> or maybe that which is imprisoned, <laughs> like truth, in my own body of unrighteousness. Well, my point is that maybe God does not create these vessels of wrath so much as allow them to think that they have created themselves, which means that ultimately they are a delusion. They're the product of a lie. And weirder still, it's not even clear whether or not it's God's wrath that's in these vessels or on these vessels or is these vessels, are these vessels. For, for God has, did you hear that? Endured these vessels. So when did God Almighty ever endure? Because he's God, he's Almighty, right? When did God Almighty ever endure vessels of wrath? Well, how about, like, all the time? I mean, don't you ever get angry? And, and in the end, don't we know that there's really only one to blame? Like we talked about last time, only one with actual free will. The free will of God o Almighty. So when did God Almighty ever endure vessels of wrath? And by that I mean angry vessels. Well, how about all the time. And in particular, on the tree in the garden on Mount Zion called the cross. Endured vessels of wrath. So anyway, what is, <laughs> just, what is a vessel of wrath? We'll stop there. This video could go on for hours. I posted this little video on my Facebook page this last week, so you may have seen it. For months this spring, as I prepared messages on Romans, wondering about the nature of the old man and the new man, the false self and the true self, the two pos, the two pos and the superman, I had to endure this angry bird. And it kind of made me angry. At first, we couldn't figure out what the incessant banging was, for, you know, we'd find nothing when we'd walk into the kitchen where the banging came from. Nothing would be there. But one morning, Susan saw this bird hit the window and fly away. Then she noticed, like, blood and bird goo smeared all over the, the window. And then we realized that if we stood still, about 10 feet from the kitchen window, this bird, a robin, would just keep flying into the window over and over and over and over every morning, sometimes for hours on end, bang, 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 bang. We stack things in front of the window. We tape scary things to the inside of the window, but this bird would perch on our sack of baskets and chairs and just keep flying into the window. I mean, we really wondered, is that bird insane? Is it possessed? Who or what made this bird so angry? Finally, my daughter Elizabeth did some Google searching and discovered that in spring, when male robins are like all jacked up on testosterone, which I kind of relate to, but when that happens, 
They'll sometimes see their reflection in a window and think that this, this reflection, which they produce just by looking at the window, they will think that this image is a competitor. They don't realize that this enemy isn't a real threat, but actually an image of themselves created by themselves and then judged to be a threat while jacked up on testosterone and ego. See, the male robin wants to be king of all he would survey, and so he will attack other birds to make them go away. But no matter how often he flies in the window, he can't make his own reflection go away. Every time he looks back, there it is once again. Our robin tried, he tried for like two months. According to Elizabeth's research, they either kill themselves or, or they, they give up when testosterone levels drop in late spring. But all they really need to defeat the enemy is repentance. That means get a new mind, surrender the bird brain, and submit to reality. They need to be saved, not from other birds, but from their own judgment. I think that's why Paul wrote what he did in Romans 6, 11. Remember, he said, you must consider yourself, reason yourself, logic yourself, logos yourself, dead to sin, and living to God in Christ Jesus. And, and, and he didn't say to sin, he said to the sin. There's an article in the Greek, so what is the sin? Well, like we talked about, it's the original sin, which we all have committed at a tree in the garden sanctuary of our own soul. We take the knowledge of good and evil, and then we construct an image of what we think we should be, right? But then realize that we are not, and then try even harder to become. That self, that false self, stands before each of us as an idol that we serve, and an accuser that we can never appease. It tells us who we should be but are not. It is our evil taskmaster, our enslaver, and our own deepest prison. I try to be him, and I can't make myself him, and so I constantly beat myself up and beat him up because he's my own projection of me. So every time I look in the mirror and judge myself, I find myself to be just a little more bloodied and covered in a little more bird goo than the last time. I'm always trying to create myself, redeem myself, and so justify myself, but I only end up condemning myself, and that self is not actually who I am. I blame myself, and then I'll find a way to blame God for myself, but that self is not actually myself, only the projection of myself created by me and my judgments rather than by God and His judgment. It's the vessel of my own wrath in which I am imprisoned. The book of James refers to the law as a mirror. We look in and we see what we should be but can't seem to make ourselves become. But he also refers to the perfect law or the completed law, the law of liberty, the law of freedom. We look into that mirror and we become who it is that we actually are. And so we do good works, which God prepared beforehand, same word, that we would walk in them. Ephesians 2.10, that's Paul. And Paul also talks about mirrors, and that we look in a mirror dimly in 1 Corinthians, but one day we will look face to face, and then we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. Lovers look into each other's eyes and see themselves reflected there as the apple of their lover's eye. Remember there are two ways of knowing in Scripture, one that brings death and one that results in, in, in babies. <laughs> the law is the knowledge of good and evil taken from the tree in an effort to make oneself in the image of God, and it's dead knowledge. Love is knowledge given on the tree by the one who is life and who is our helper, our helper made fit for each and every one of us, his bride. So when I stand at the foot of the cross, I discover who I am not. I am not a good person who created himself with his own knowledge of good and evil. 
I discover who I am not and who I am. I am the Beloved, created with body broken and blood shed, and it is finished, and I'm good. So you see, I'll never conquer the sin. I'll never conquer the sin or any sin, shame, anxiety, or fear. I'll never conquer the enemy by condemning my old man and trying to fix my old man with my old man. I mean, I look back in the mirror and there he is, just a little more bloody and covered in bird goo. I can only conquer my old man through the revelation that he's been conquered, that he's dead, and in truth, never actually existed. And that's called repentance. I lose my psyche and find it. I surrender my bird brain and receive the mind of Christ. I know as I am fully and eternally known, and that's 100% mercy. And if I think I deserve that mercy, I still don't know mercy. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's mercy that wakes us up to mercy. Well, the bird was angry. And I was angry, I was angry at the bird, but I didn't have the ability to bring an end to all that anger. To do that, I would have to like enter the psyche of that bird and give that bird a new thought, a new idea, a new word, implanted like a seed in that brain. Well, we each create a false self, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, we really get down to it, that's your problem, right? We each create a false self who really pisses us off. And I bet we also create false neighbors who, who then we like to blame for pissing us off. We know what they should be, but they can't seem to be, and that just pisses us off. And I bet we create a false God, that is, we think God, what we think God should be, but refuses to be, which makes us nail him to a tree. We're all angry at God. Why? Well, because we think our judgment is better than God's judgment. That's what sin is, right? Isn't it? We think our judgment is better than God's judgment because we got a little knowledge of good and evil somewhere along the line. Remember how Adam and Eve took knowledge of good and realized they weren't good and so cover themselves? They, they, they blamed themselves. And then remember how Adam blamed Eve and then remember how Adam blamed God for making Eve. You made her, God. He followed the blame train. I think we're, and I think we're supposed to follow. He followed the blame train like we all follow the blame train like we spoke on last time. In the end, there's only one to blame, the free will of God, who is the judgment of God. We all follow the blame train until we end up back in the garden and realize that there's only one to blame and he has no fault. And he's not blaming us. Which means everything is going according to plan. Which means all of our anger is about nothing, nothing but the revelation of mercy. Mercy which isn't nothing, but is actually the only something Everything that's anything is mercy. We were created out of nothing. Everything that's anything is mercy. It's grace, even and especially us. We come back to the tree and all our anger turns into something else entirely. Romans 9, 20. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Maybe you're his kid predestined to freedom as he is free, to be free as he is free. Will what is molded say to its molder, why'd you make me like this? Well, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump for Amma one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his, his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles? 
Now, like we talked about last time, Paul is quoting these amazing verses out of Isaiah, and he's alluding to these fascinating stories about Jeremiah and a potter in the potter's field where Judas hung himself in the valley of Gehenna just outside the walls of Jerusalem. In Jeremiah 18, God tells Jeremiah to watch this potter making a pot, that's an earthen vessel, make up this pot from a lump of clay, and, and then when the pot is spoiled on the wheel, the potter reworks it into another vessel, and the Lord says this, O oh Israel, O oh house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done? You think I can't do that? Jeremiah 19, God tells Jeremiah to buy one of the potter's earthen vessels and then break it in the potter's field and say to everyone watching, thus says the Lord of hosts, so will I break this people and this city so it cannot be mended. You cannot mend it. Those people were the Jews of Judah, which also became a name, and that name is Judas. And that city was Jerusalem which people have built time and time again, and it keeps getting destroyed time and time again, but then it comes down new and forever new from God. Jeremiah 31, I was their husband, declares the Lord, husband to Israel. But then, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. They shall all, all, and he's talking about people that have been dead for a long time, they shall all know me. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The city shall be rebuilt and the measuring line shall go out further. The whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes. That's the valley of Gehenna, sometimes translated hell. The whole valley shall be holy to the Lord. Hell will be swallowed up by the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven. According to God in Jeremiah. And check this out. When the city comes down, it will be constructed with living stones filled with glory, and one of the foundation stones will apparently be Judas. <laughs> Not because he chose, but because God chose Judas and Judah and the Jews. You see, apparently, apparently, God can do things that we cannot do. And one day we'll know it because we will be known by him, our creator. So, so anyway, maybe a vessel of wrath is a vessel upon which God exercises wrath by destroying it and then making it new. You know, broken pottery will eventually turn, I was a geology maybe, eventually turn back to clay and then can be made again into to an earthen vessel, a pot. Or maybe a vessel of wrath is a vessel upon which God exercises wrath by making it new. That's what the potter did with the lump of clay on the wheel, and according to Scripture, well, you are a pot on that wheel right now, being created right now. Maybe a vessel of wrath is a vessel that's empty. That, that ticks me off. I mean, maybe it's empty of what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, faith, gentleness, temperance. Maybe it's empty of faith, hope, and love. And so what is it full of? Itself, full of pride, which is a ridiculous illusion. It's a dream <laughs> that turns into a nightmare. Maybe it's empty of mercy, which means it's full of anger. Maybe it's empty of reason, which means it's a stupid, angry bird. Maybe God destroys that vessel of wrath by emptying it of wrath and filling it with mercy. And check this out, God is mercy. Hesed in Hebrew, that's relentless love. Calvinists will argue that some people need to be vessels of wrath so that other people, that is themselves, will be grateful for mercy for themselves. Arminians will argue that some people need to be vessels of wrath so that other people, that is themselves, will display the glory of human dignity because they have freely chosen mercy and so saved themselves. Paul is saying that each of us by nature, this is Ephesians 2, are children of wrath or vessels of wrath predestined to become vessels of mercy such that one day we would know mercy for we've been known by mercy and so freely choose mercy who is our helper and our husband and the deepest longing of our collective soul and our individual souls. 
Next verse. As indeed he says in Hosea. Remember, Paul's just going through the Old Testament, bang, bang, bang. Those who were not my people, sounds like a vessel of wrath, I will call my people. <laughs> that sounds like a vessel of mercy. And her who was not beloved, or no mercy, as it appears usually translated in the Old Testament, uh, her who was not uh, uh, beloved, that has to be a vessel of wrath, right? I will call beloved. That's definitely a vessel of mercy. And in the very place, tapas, where it was said to them, you are not my people, there, in that place, they will be called sons of the living God. Now, hopefully remember that the prophet Hosea, whose name means salvation, was commanded to marry Gomer the harlot. Why? So that Hosea would know what it was like for Yahweh to be married to Israel. And then he's commanded to name one of his children no mercy, for, quote, I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. Then he's commanded to name one of his children not my people, which is equivalent to calling all of Judah a bunch of illegitimate bastards, for you are not my people, and I am not your God, says the Lord. But then God says that he will take his whoring bride Israel into the wilderness, and he will romance her there by making a door of hope, and he will betroth her to himself in faithfulness, and Israel will know the Lord. Then in Hosea 2.23, he says, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he, Israel, shall say to me, you are my God. And in that very place, that very moment of space and time where they experience rejection and wrath, in the very place where it was said to them, and we don't know who says this to him exactly, you are not my people, in that place. You see, those places have a purpose. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, you will be called sons of the living God. And notice that the order isn't reverse. I mean, it's not my people before people, not people before not my people. It isn't reversed as if it's critical to experience, experience at least, rejection in moments in time in order to know what it is to be chosen for all eternity. And in the very place, tapas, which sounds a whole lot like tupas, right? And remember when we talked about the, the tupas, Romans chapter five? We learned that the first Adam, the old Adam, was a tupas, an imprint of the eschatos Adam, the Superman. An imprint of the eschatos Adam in a lump of clay. And hopefully you all remember how that imprint in the clay then was like the knowledge of the good in the form of the absence of the good, right? Because this is the good and this is knowledge of good in the absence of good, or knowledge of life but experienced as death, or knowledge of what I should be but I cannot seem to make myself, a knowledge of Jesus in the form of the absence of Jesus. You see, the tupas is a vessel of wrath. And that would mean that every vessel of wrath is a pattern created by the ultimate and eternal vessel of mercy, Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet every vessel of wrath, every vessel of wrath is still prepared by us in space and time. Hopefully you remember how the tupas grew in Romans chapter 5. The law came in, knowledge of good, good and evil came in to increase the trespass, which does what? It increases the tupas, the body of sin and death. Because every time we sin, what do we do? We take the life of Jesus and so crucify Jesus and then experience the absence of Jesus, and then a greater and greater need for Jesus. So that where sin increased, that would be a vessel of wrath. In that very place, grace will abound all the more. That's mercy. So, so you see, there is no vessel of wrath without an eternal and corresponding vessel of mercy. In, in Romans chapter 6, hopefully remember that Paul referred to the Tupas, who is Adam, as the old Adam. And we learned that there is a new man that is born of the old Adam. And that Adam is somehow also the eschatos 
Adam, that is the eternal Adam implanted in the old man like, like a baby in a womb. That's a baby begotten from above, growing in space and time, fixing to be born out of space and time into the age to come eternity. I know that all sounds crazy, but I didn't write the Bible, so just deal with it. (laughs) Next verse. And Isaiah, which means Yahweh is salvation, cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, literally sperm, or more literally a sperm, because according to, according to Paul in Galatians, it's a sperm, the promise and indestructible sperm, Jesus, if the Lord had not left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. And we've talked about that. God even makes them new. But hopefully remember that Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up in Isaiah chapter 6. Remember that, right? And the Lord tells Isaiah to preach a burning word, a word that will burn Israel down to a remnant and then burn the remnant even further down to a stump. And then God says, the stump is the holy seed, sacred sperm. And through that seed, God redeems not only all of Israel, but all creation. (laughs) At the end of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66, which I think has seriously become like my favorite chapter in the Bible, all flesh, which is all humanity, all flesh gazes down from the edge of the new Jerusalem on all the corpses of all that have rebelled against God, which according to Isaiah is all humanity and the slaughtered lamb who has numbered himself with us. The corpses, those bodies of sin and death, those vessels of wrath are being destroyed by eternal fire in the potter's field in the valley of Gehenna. While these people, these vessels of mercy, that were once imprisoned in those very vessels of wrath, worship God with inexpressible joy for having saved them from themselves. In time, we are vessels of wrath, writes Karl Barth. In eternity, we are not merely something more, but something utterly different. We are vessels of mercy. And now I need to tell you a story that you'll probably find hard to believe. But for me, it's an experience that I seriously cannot unbelieve because it was just so real at the time. I've told you before, but I can't preach these verses without telling you again. And then I'll probably need to refer to it once again before we end the book of Romans. But soon after I had been defrocked for merely hoping that God might have mercy on all, Soon after the sanctuary had started, Susan and I prayed for a friend for whom we'd spent countless hours praying over the previous 14, 15 years or so. She'd been raised in the occult and ritually wed to the evil one. But God had done some utterly amazing and miraculous things to to show her very clearly that she was actually his bride and not the mother of death, but the mother of the living. There's a word for that in Hebrew, Eve. (laughs) She had just returned from a mission trip to Africa to minister to, to orphans. She was doing so much better now, but this one night on that trip, she had found herself by a campfire where some men sacrificed a goat in a, in a bonfire, that bonfire. The evil one, well, he used it to remind her of some things, fill her with fear, believe some old lies, and so surrender to his design. So as we had done countless times before, we prayed through the memory, dealing with all sorts of demonic crap and looking for for Jesus. Susan will often see what the person that we're praying for will see, but I have to go on what they tell me. My friend couldn't see Jesus. And because of the events in her past, she was utterly terrified to look at the fire. 
that very tapas, that very place in particular. It was there that she had been told by evil people that she was not beloved of God, that for her he had no mercy. So she, she felt frail, like a dry leaf driven by the wind. Finally, I just suggested, just look in the direction of the fire. And, and then I remember she said, well, I don't see him. And then, wait. Jesus is standing in the fire. He motioned to our friend, revealing that she had something she was hanging on to that he wanted her to surrender to him. And so in the vision, she, you know, and then acting it out, she handed it to him, standing there in the fire. And then I remember she looked at him and she said, but I'm still really angry. I'm just really angry. She was angry at herself that she had been so fragile and easily deceived. She may have been angry at me because I often don't know what to do in these situations. And she was definitely angry at God. She knew him now. She had witnessed his power. And so there was no denying he had let this all happen. Like her life up to that point. And he, he had let it happen. He had let it happen. She was angry at God's judgment and that was her judgment. I'm really angry, she said. And then I remember I just blurted out, well, I'm angry too. If there was a year in my life when I felt most faithful to God, done what I was asked, regardless of the consequences, it had been that year. The year that my church blew up and I was defrocked and my kids were turned into pariahs in their respective social groups, which all had to do with church. I had had thousands of attenders, book contracts, agents. I thought we were set for a reformation and then it all seriously, like miraculously blew up. There were plenty of folks to blame, including myself and the devil, but in the end, I knew exactly who was in charge, Jesus. I was really angry at the judgment of God and Jesus is the judgment of God. And then I remember Susan said, well, I'm angry too. So I asked them after, after a while. We're all sitting there angry. I said, well, what's Jesus doing now? And they said, he's still standing in that fire with his hands outstretched as if he wants us to join him. And they said, well, okay, let's walk into the fire. So we stood up, held hands, and we said something like, God, just baptize us with your fire, and then we step forward. In the words of Paul in Romans 12, verse 1, we did the logikos thing, the logical worship. We presented our bodies a living sacrifice. We stepped into the fire, the three of us, and a fourth man, all of us of one lump in one fire, after a time, just standing there, because, you know, I don't really know exactly what's going on, I said to my friend, well, what do you see? And I remember she turned to me and she said, you're ugly. And I said, I know, but I mean in the vision. And she and Susan both said, yeah, in the vision, Peter, you're all like burned up and charred and really, really ugly. We all are. I kind of didn't know what to say at that point. The pause was longer than I wanted it to be. And then Susan said, Peter, ask Jesus to blow on us. I did. And he did. And then I heard my friend just <gasps> gasp in absolute wonder. And she began to yell, I'm not fragile. I'm not fragile. I'm not fragile. Then she and Susan described what they saw. When Jesus blew on us, he blew the ashes away from our skin revealing these bright, white, indestructible, and eternal beings within. We were eternal vessels of mercy, hidden in and born from vessels of wrath, vessels of wrath which we had prepared for destruction in time, and yet they had been the very imprint of eternity. Where sin had increased, grace, eternal grace, had abounded all the more. And so we had come to know about evil, but in that very place, God revealed the good, and he is the good. And so we freely chose to worship him, and that's good. That's life. That's eternal life. So you see, I don't mean to harp on this, 
I worry about that sometimes. And, and maybe after 15 years I can talk a little more freely. But I think it's genuinely diabolical that the church has believed the snake. And so with all our talk of the fires of hell, or our hiding it under the rug or however we use it, we've actually taught people to run from the judgment of God when the judgment of God is salvation. Before you know it, you will see Jesus. And I imagine that he'll be filled with fire and shining brighter than the sun like he was for Paul on the road to Damascus. You'll see Jesus and you'll be tempted to run and hide in outer darkness for you have been a vessel of wrath and you will see that all your wrath is directed at him. But look again and you will see that his wrath is directed against your wrath with which you keep him and yourself imprisoned. Him, because he has descended into your prison of unbelief and anger as a seed of indestructible hope. His wrath upon your wrath is infinite mercy. All your wrath is the product of attempting to justify yourself and your world. And his wrath on your wrath is the revelation that you have always been justified. It is absolute grace. So before you know it, you will see Jesus. And when you do, don't run from the judgment of God. Run right into the judgment of God, the holy fire. Actually, I hope that's why you're here this morning to practice. For on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and, and do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We sang for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And there are a couple ways to see that. For God the just is satisfied. What is the justice of God? Not that we get what we deserve, but that he gets what he deserves. And what is that? Well, it's children made in his own image and likeness. And he looks on him and pardon me. And where is he? Well, he's in me. He's descended into me. And who is he? Well, he's the heart of the Father. You know, it's Father's Day. I was thinking about this in the, in the shower this morning. My experience is that Father's Day is the lowest attended Sunday of the entire year. In fact, Bill was saying, <laughs> Bill was saying, where's Bill? He was saying this to me. Yeah, Bill and Bill. Bill, this is the Bill aisle right here. Bill Fleming was saying to me, he was saying, He's, this was a Father's Day a few years ago. He said, it's Father's Day. And, you know, everybody goes to church on Mother's Day. They get flowers. They talk about how great they are. You go on Father's Day and just talk about how bad of a father you are. I was thinking, yeah, that's kind of true. And then I also was thinking, and nobody comes. And I go, well, and that's probably because God is our Father. And this is the crazy thing. We have just said some awful, awful things about our Father. And supposedly, we're his bride. Maybe we're a little bit more like a harlot. <laughs> and I think we should wish him a happy Father's Day. <laughs> um, because he is a, 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 good, a good father. I want to say something. I was trying to remember what it was. Yeah, I don't know. But the idea that my father has other children that he endlessly tortures, that is problematic for my heart. And what the church has said about God our Father, it gets me kind of angry. <laughs> and what happened 
to me, and happens to a lot of us, gets me angry as well. And people sometimes say, Peter, you seem angry. And I'm like, yeah, I am kind of angry. <laughs> but I'm not angry because I follow the blame train. <laughs> and I realize, well, I can blame myself, but there are things... But if I blame myself, I'm really blaming the one who, who made me. I can blame other people, but I'm really blaming the one who him, made him. I, I follow the blame train all the way back to a garden <laughs> and to this. <laughs> so even the fact that we misrepresented God goes back to this, um, b blaming God. And, and what is it that God says? He says, look, um, y'all, I wanted to show you something. So why is this world so screwed up? Why are we all so angry? Why is there so much suffering? I think Paul is telling us because dad wants to show us something. And that's his heart. <laughs> so, let's just do this together, okay? Close your eyes. And say, dad, you can just say this sound in your heart. I repent for all the bad stuff I've said about you, the bad stuff I've thought in the depths of my heart. There are times when I've described you as the evil one, but you're not the evil one. You are the good. I think I'm beginning to see it. So, I just want to say, Happy Father's Day. Amen.